I've already manifested a lot and it's like, I'm going to keep manifesting. It's really about just doing it and not overthinking it or over controlling it. That attitude has been a key to unlocking this work. Just show up for it. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. And your host, Jessica Gill. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. And by pressing play, the process begins. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Expanded. Jess here. We have another incredible process guest for you today who is really touching on what it means to surrender to this work, to surrender in general, to trust your intuition, to have a manifestation trust muscle, to not be a skeptic or a cynic or fearing that, yeah, that can happen for other people, but just not for me. How do you start to build that step by step? And how do you go about manifesting all of the things that you truly want in your life and overwrite those limiting belief neural pathways? What is a good protocol when approaching the unblocking work and how to move through those negative sensations with a bit more compassion? We're diving into all that today with Sonia, and Sonia was actually seven days away from her due date for her pregnancy that she manifested with this work that she got by committing to doing one deep imagining for 60 days. She did the anxiety DI, and it lifted the anxiety from her mind, body, and soul in order to be open enough to receive a baby and many other manifestations that came through. So if surrender is something that maybe you've struggled with in the past or need that warm reminder of how to connect back to it again, this episode is going to be for you. Enjoy. And now a word from our partners. Okay, TBMers, if you have been manifesting the launch of your own online business, you've been elevating your self-worth with the TBM work, and you're ready to hear about some of the entrepreneurial tools that we use at TBM, we have good news for you. You are invited to attend a free upcoming Magnetize and Monetize webinar with our very own online platform, Kajabi. Kajabi is the industry-leading all-in-one platform that makes it simple to create a successful online business. It is the first platform that TBM has used that has allowed us to manage all of our different online portals in one section. So our online courses, our membership, our community group, our payments, our email contacts, analytics, website, our mobile app, everything we could need to be running our online business of To Be Magnetic, we can do through Kajabi. It has been incredible. We even have launched an app in the past year with them. Our community group continues to get better and better. And Kajabi is always innovating their services. So as things grow in the marketplace, they are continuing to add new services every single year. If you are interested in attending this free webinar, you can use the link in the show notes to sign up and attend. If you can't attend the specific time, it's February 8th at 11 a.m. PST. You can receive a recording of the event and the PDF guide afterwards. This is for entrepreneurs with digital products, workshops, podcasts, coaching, community. If you're curious about growing into any of those platforms or about the Kajabi platform, this is for you. Nikki, our director of operations, will also be speaking on behalf of To Be Magnetic, discussing how we've utilized these tools to really uplevel our business. Check the link in the show notes to learn more and attend the webinar. All right. Onto the episode. I'm so excited to be sitting here on a Sunday afternoon with Sonia. This is so cool because we met in person in 
Los Feliz at one of my favorite coffee shops ever. (laughs) I'm actually drinking a matcha from them right now. They have my favorite matcha. And I remember the day that we met, you had just submitted your process testimonial. You got a ping randomly, like in the middle of the night. It was literally the middle of the night which is something that happens when you're like extremely, extremely pregnant. (laughs) A lot of middle of the night wake ups. And yeah, it was also after the LA speaking tour, I had raised my hand there and didn't get called on. But I had this funny feeling that that was sort of kismet also, because I was like, I don't know, like when or how exactly, but I just like want to talk to like Jess (laughs) so badly about some of these energetics and process and I don't have an outlet. And then I forgot about it, that feeling I sort of was like, well, whatever. And then, yeah, I had this ping in the middle of the night of just to do it. I think I always thought that, oh, I'll just do it a little later and a little later. But now I realize I've already manifested a lot and it's like, I'm going to keep manifesting. So there would just be like way too much content. Yeah. <laughs> that's a I think that's a common thing too is people don't think that what they have to manifest is big enough and they're like waiting for like that almost like external life to mirror this dream thing. And I know we have a lot of guests on with very material big things. And part of that's on purpose because it's easy to understand what's going on energetically when you have something material to latch on to. People who have been doing the work and keep showing up for themselves have the wisdom of this work that the community really needs to hear about what is it like in the trenches of this process. And you've also manifested like crazy too. Now I'm starting to really be in flow. So I'm like the pain kind of makes sense. But I will say that when I submitted, I was very not attached to outcome. I was very just like following a ping. And I was like, I just want to write this to Jess. And if it's like the right time and if this information is meant to help people in the community because I'm just, I've become really grateful for the community. Like I was like, okay, then great. But if not, it'll happen if it's meant to happen, whatever, which I think also is a big part of where I am in the process. It's the trust that doesn't come overnight, but once you have it, it's much easier to be in that magnetic place where you're not attached as much to something happening or you don't need it to feel a certain way about your work or your process or whatever. And then, but then when I submitted it in the middle of the night and then walked to Blue Bottle, which is around the corner from my new house and saw you, I was like, oh. And then while we were chatting, like one of my expanders walked by and I was like, oh. Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh. I forgot about that too. Talk about that surrender piece. And we'll get into your sun, moon and rising too in a second. But- that surrender piece, because that is such a tough energetic, I think, for people to wrap their minds around. Like, what does it mean to surrender to the universe? How do I let this go? Like, all I can think about is this thing and I'm, you know, analyzing like, is this a test? Is this not a test? How should I navigate this? There's a lot of fear and perfectionism. And I think surrender is one of those sensations. You can describe it to people till you're blue in the face, but until they felt the feeling of what it's like to surrender, it's really hard to understand. It's a feeling, it's a sensation. How do you feel like that works for you? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually really opinionated on that because I really identify with the person who isn't experiencing that yet and doesn't understand. It kind of reminds me of a feeling I used to have when I was trying to force myself to be in a state of gratitude doing the five minute journal exercise where it's like, what are you grateful for today? And not that there's anything wrong with that. I think that stuff helped me at the time. But what I love about this process is that there's no spiritual bypass whatsoever. You're really not supposed to be forcing yourself to feel surrender if you don't. The whole process exists to get you there. And if you're not there yet, that's okay because I think in a way it does have to be sort of earned and it does come from, for me at least, a certain amount of unblocking, you know, and expansion and action and all three feed into each other. But for me, it's like, it is the subconscious piece because if you're not in surrender, you probably have a good reason, but that reason might not be in your conscious mind. 
the reason might be something very legitimate to you when you were four years old that put you in a state of lack or scarcity or not feeling enough. And to then be hard on yourself, telling yourself, oh, just be in surrender so you can get the thing when there's like some wounded child part of you. There's no reason why you have to reach surrender or reach gratitude or reach that place before you've actually done the work. If you're in a test or a trigger instead, it's really unpleasant, but that is the process of where you are. And through those tests and triggers, there is a path to get to surrender. But if you're not there yet, that's normal and that's okay. And especially because this process revolves around manifestation, it's an interesting paradox because you're using the manifestation, the desire, which is so human and normal, to look at all of the wounds and all of the stuff operating in the subconscious. But if you're in a conscious state trying to surrender and there's something that you want, and you're in a bad situation of any sort, and you're worried about money or you're being tested or triggered by your relationships, to be hard on yourself and be like wishing you were in surrender or wishing that you had that trust muscle with the universe when it's not there yet, I think is too much to ask. So that's one of my favorite things about this brand. And like, you know, it is what is really different about just this work. There's no spiritual bypass. So if you're not feeling surrender, that's fine. You can still be in the process. You shouldn't ask that of yourself in a way like, you know, my trust muscle with something like having a ping and waking up in the night, but being not attached to outcome just comes from having enough trust with the universe that I've manifested things recently and that I've probably unblocked enough. You know, I didn't write because I was really needing you to validate me or for someone from TBM to be like, good job, Sonia, you really, you know, worked on your wounds and here's a gold star or something, you know. <laughs> I love this process so much and I am a huge nerd for it. So, but yeah, that whole sort of gold star idea of needing that from something outside of yourself. Again, I think that's really natural until you've spent some time unblocking and just being in the process and you know, that's why there are all these things like the monthly check-in and the trust DI, because the whole point here, at least as I understand it, is like the universe is also earning it. You know, you're, you're building it. It's a relationship with yourself and it's a relationship with this work. So you're building it slowly or quickly, but you're building it at the exact pace you need to, depending on what's going on in your subconscious and as you work on it, the trust builds. And then suddenly one day you'll be in surrender. I love, love, love how you describe that. I think that's so powerful. There's not like a day when you're like, today I've switched into surrender. It's more of a gradual, slow build. It's like building muscles. You know, yeah. you're like slowly building that muscle again and again and again. Then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I can lift this weight with such ease. I didn't used to be able to do that. Oh, okay. This is what it feels like here. Exactly. Okay. What is your sun, moon, and rising sign? I'm an Aquarius sun, Aquarius moon, and Virgo rising. Oh my gosh. All the wisdom washing through. Yeah. So it's kind of the combination of, I mean, everything I've ever read about Aquarius, I'm like, mm, yeah. And then <laughs> the Virgo rising is a little tougher for me, but also it's like, I do identify with it because it's very grounded and sort of the trouble with Virgo that I identify with is some of the perfectionism and dog paddling and being overly serious. So I feel like it does relate to like what we're going to talk about today because there's a nice balance between those. But yes, I have a lot of Aquarius. I love that. And then what about your childhood background and upbringing? My cultural background is in terms of ethnicity, I'm Eastern European Jewish. And my grandparents were from Poland on my mom's side and were like refugees from World War II. And both my parents, both my parents are Eastern European Jewish ancestry and grew up in Kentucky. But I grew up in New York 
in Brooklyn, a very, very diverse, I would say more like working class neighborhood, like not what people think of (laughs) as Brooklyn now, at least at that time, it wasn't trendy. But then I also went to a very elite school and had that kind of like New York upbringing. So I feel like all of those things really influenced me because there's just so many almost like conflicting influences and intergenerational trauma is a major thing in my family too because of the war and the Holocaust. And it's something that everyone in my generation, like my cousins and I are all dealing with in different ways, but weren't necessarily raised with an awareness of it. So I was really enjoying last week's podcast about that. Yeah. So that's a piece for me, but there's, it's interesting because a lot of things ended up in my shadow because I had a lot of shadow about all the privilege that I had, but I also sort of was growing up with a lot of legacy of trauma and also like in a very different type of environment and neighborhood than the people I was going to school with. So I felt like a very privileged person in my neighborhood and then at school and I, you know, I had like privilege and spoiled in my shadow as a lot of privileged kids do, I think. But then also at school, I felt totally less than and was super aware of us having less money than everyone else. And so it's really interesting how things can just be in your shadow that are completely in conflict. Isn't that so interesting? And then also makes you realize oh, there was no winning for me. If I couldn't be this and I also couldn't be this and those things are opposites, then what could I be? I had to be enough of this, but not too much of it and like a little bit of this, but not that much. You know, it's like this tightrope you put yourself on. Yeah, and I think it's really common just societally. I think I do see a lot of people with similar shadow and, and it's too bad. It's too bad that like also so many privileged people feel so much shadow about it because then there isn't just an ability to be aware of privilege and just own it. And then at the same time, so many people are feeling less than, and there's a lot of separation. So yeah, I definitely have had to confront that and look at that. But it was also a very enriching upbringing in a lot of ways. And I really identify with a lot of immigrant culture in general because of my grandparents and my husband's parents are from Lebanon and I find that American experience really fascinating. So what led you to the TBM work? Actually, I would say it was my now husband in a way, but not directly. It's interesting because I had manifested that relationship before I started TBM through doing a lot of things that I now identify as the process, but I didn't have all the tools. I just was instinctively doing some of it. So like before I met him, I was following all these mature men on Instagram and like looking at their profiles every day. I was just like every day looking at like Mark Groves, Sylvester McNutt, Young Pueblo, just like any of these like masculine entities that felt sensitive and emotionally evolved. So I was expanding a lot. And then I jumped off a cliff and moved to LA in September, 2020. So Now, looking back on it, I'm like, that's a lot of situational magnetism. And I was expanding a ton. And I was doing some of my own work process of like trying to move on from wounds of past relationships and tests and low self-worth situations that I had been in and stuff. So I had manifested him, but about six months into the relationship, because I didn't have the other tools, a lot of our stuff started to come out. And I was feeling like extremely insecure. That's something that's also interesting about certain manifestations. It's not like you manifest it and then it's over. Often I find for me, a manifestation is in itself a kind of challenge that was pushing my evolution forward. So I was feeling really insecure and I just didn't know how to handle all the stuff that was coming out, which happens in intimate relationships. And I was listening to the Mark Groves podcast and Lacey was a guest. The first moment I heard her pitching these workshops and everything that they encompass, the neuroscience, but especially the subconscious work, which is something that I already was totally, I totally believed in. I just like signed up for the pathway right away. So that was in May, 2021. And it was all because I just was feeling insecure and didn't know what to do. And I stumbled upon it. That's what brings 
a lot of people to this kind of work because it's like, how do I get a little bit of understanding about what the heck is going on with me? And how do I have some autonomy here? How do I take control of the reins? Because so many times all of our outside forces, test triggers, all these things, it feels like, oh my God, life is just coming at me. And like, why? Why is this happening? Why can't I get a grip on this one dynamic? Or like, how do I get more confident? Or how do I grow this trust muscle or whatever it is? How do I fix this? And I think with the TBM work, this is your roadmap back to you, guided by you. Yes, there is tools and information and all the things that you can apply and use and all the things, but you are your own guide in it, you know? And I think that's a really unique way of healing. Totally. Looking back on before, (laughs) I really wish I had the work because I am a person that gets rock bottomed a lot. And now I see it as part of my process because there's always a manifestation like pretty close. But look like when you don't know that, it just feels terrible and there's no map. It's like, obviously, you know, no one's controlling life because the nature of being alive is there's going to be some chaos and pain in it and loss. But through this work, I feel like there is a pattern of growth. That's what the pattern is. The pattern is evolution. So once I realized that, I think it does make, for me, it made rock bottoms, like my rock bottoms are just much easier now, partly because I have the work, but partly because I understand that everything is growing me so much. Talk about being like a skeptic at first and that process. Yeah, I love this story, actually. So when I discovered TBM, like I was very ripe for it, I think, like I was ready to find it, which is, of course, when all things find us. But I was still pretty cynical I think that's natural, right? Because we're not taught that any of this. Some cynicism, I think, can be good because it means that you're not going to fall for something that's trying to be manipulative or whatever. But it was really blocking me in this work because I knew, like I had heard Lacey and you and Dr. Tara say that you have to build your trust muscle and that you build it through minis. But it wasn't connecting for me. Like I wasn't able to the trust wasn't like hitting. So this was during my first manifestation challenge. I had went through how to manifest again. Obviously, like a big part of the process is like, pick some minis, manifest those, build your trust muscle. But it wasn't working. Like I put like a cup of coffee, free cup of coffee on my list. And the cynical part of me would just be like, well, this doesn't mean anything. I put some jeans on my list manifested them pretty easily, but it's like, I found them at Crossroads and I've been shopping at Crossroads for years and found so many cool steals, you know, and it didn't feel like that. Wow. Moment. Yeah. And there was a part of me that there's a part of me that felt really stupid, a cynical protective part that I think exists to protect us from getting disappointed and believing in magic too much. And, you know, I was like trying to write down minis, but I just, I felt really stupid. And I was like, I don't even want to spend all this time manifesting little objects and things. And I still had also a lot of shadow about like materialism that was kind of operating in me that I think also very common, but yeah, I just felt so dumb, but I was like, okay, but I feel stupid, but I want to do the process. So in Lacey's examples in how to manifest, she has like, for example, manifest like Levi's vintage Levi's or something or vintage cocktail glasses for under $25. So I just wrote down in my notebook, okay, I just, I had never thought about vintage cocktail glasses. I really didn't have any desire for them before that, but I was like, okay, I'll just write that down. And then the manifestation challenge was over around Christmas time. I had become aware, I think also through just doing some of the work because I had done inner child workshop and things were starting to come up. I was really stressed out that season. There was so much anxiety around COVID. I was dealing with for the first time having like two families to deal with because I was in for the first time in a long time, a serious relationship. You know, we were expected to do holidays in both places, like Christmas with my partner and like Hanukkah with my family. I just realized that it was stressing me out so much and that I just didn't want to. 
And I also had had already had my family visiting here in Los Angeles, and it just felt like too much for me. But at that time, I wasn't used to having needs and wants like that, identifying them and like standing up for them. And it was actually a really big deal. I think through all of this like introspection, it's like, you're like, I don't want to do that. I'm stressed out. So I told my family, I'm not going to be coming home for Hanukkah or holidays or whatever. I'm going to be going to the East Coast. I'm not going to be going home. And I hadn't been back to New York in a really long time. I felt bad telling my friends and family, but I didn't want to go back. So anyway, I told my family that. And it was really hard, but, you know, they they were like, okay. So then, you know, a week or so later, we arrive at my partner's family's house. And the first day we're there, his mom is like, there's something I want to show you. I don't know if you guys want it, but just come down to the basement. And she takes me down to the basement and digs through all these boxes and takes out this box of the most incredible vintage cocktail glasses from Lebanon from the 80s, like a full set, crystal, hand etched. And it was so random. Like even for her, she was like, I know this is really random, but I just like randomly thought of these. Do you guys want them? And that clicked. It was like enough factors. And I was like, holy shit. I identified a want. I set a boundary. All these things started getting tripped off in my brain. I was like, oh my God, this is my process. My process has to do with other people and my needs and setting a boundary. And then I manifested that, you know, like that was the beginning of trust muscle for me. And then I was able to use that trust muscle on other minis after that. Until then, it really wasn't clicking. And then, yeah. I think this is so powerful. And I just want for anyone who's listening brand new, when we when we're saying minis, one of the things we have people do is write down major manifestations like your relationship or career or home or something that's like in the pipeline for the next six to 12 months. But then we have minis, like those little things that will kind of boost your trust muscle that'll really help you out along the way, like the free cup of coffee or the cocktail glasses, these small little kind of one-off things that might not necessarily, it's interesting because at first we were like, oh, they don't take like a ton of unblocking and all of that, but sometimes they do. Yeah. If, if you don't have trust for these little kismet things happening. And I love how you went from being like, I got the cup of coffee. Yeah, well, I could have gotten that anyways. Oh, I got the Levi's. Yeah, well, I could have, I just bought them. So what's, you know what I mean? Like, what's the difference? I would have gotten them anyways. And in order to really have that faith, that connection of like, there is something that I'm dancing with here. It was like, okay, we're going to need you to really look at the part of you that isn't honoring your own needs. And honestly, I almost see it as like a part of you that has trouble with receiving. Because if you were only doing what your family wanted or following all of that, then it's like you can't really receive anything or what you do receive feels like you're not even giving to yourself. Totally. I, it's so funny. I really resonate with that because I had to have that moment too where I was like, I'm not coming home for Christmas this year. And that was <laughs> yeah. like a big deal. Talk about creating magnetism. If you're someone who thinks that that's just like automatic, you have to do it. And then the year you don't do it, you're like, oh my God, what did I just do? Like the whole family's going to fall apart. This is so scary. Yeah. But the fact that you did it, thankfully your family received it. It sounds like pretty well. They were fine. Yeah. And then seeing like, whoa, the like space opens up. You put your needs first. Congratulations. This is so exciting. And then the universe is like, let me show you like the best cocktail glasses you could ever imagine. <laughs> it was hard to deny. I was like, these are incredible. I've literally never thought about having these. And even my mother-in-law, I mean, we weren't married then, but was like, I know this is so weird and random. And I was like, oh, but it's not. But yeah, it was incredible. I also am realizing only now that in a way, I think it contained one of the main lessons for me with the work. For me, it's really about just doing it and not overthinking it or over controlling it. It's like there is something about submitting to 
whatever system it is where rather than, you know, cause I was like, okay, I'm just doing my homework. Basically. Lacey says cocktail glasses. I'll write this down in my notebook. There was no dog paddling energy in it of being like, I'm writing down the thing and then it has to manifest or this whole thing doesn't work or I'm worthless or, you know, all of the things that we attach to. I think there can be something really liberating about being like, this is a system It could also be thought of as a game. I'm just going to do it and see what happens. That attitude has been kind of a huge, just a key, a key to unlocking this work, just doing it and just showing up for it. And that sounds really cliche. Like, what does that mean? But I think that means just doing it without worrying about how you're doing it, whether you're doing it right, and just almost trying to like follow the directions of it and just show up for it because in a way it's like that was me showing up for it because I was like well I'll just write this down and do what it says and see what happens and just show up and just keep doing the challenge and not be like well this isn't working because I got a cup of coffee and I don't care I was like well I'm gonna finish the challenge I want to do it I want to try and I'll just show up even if I feel like I felt stupid when I wrote down the cocktail glasses I was like this is dumb that's so interesting. I I bet a lot of people are listening like, oh my God, me too. Like I felt so silly doing that. Or I felt like, what am I doing? What is this thing that I'm investing time and energy into? There's like such an element of faith in it. And then also at the same time, I'm like, no one should be asked to believe without proof either. So it's like, this is why there's this system that I really love all the principles of it because I love the neuroscience component. I've been fascinated with the subconscious from a young age. And for a long time, I think I suspected that the subconscious was behind a lot of stuff because otherwise life just is chaotic. You're like, why does this person have this and this person doesn't? Or like why I used to feel confused because I had privilege in my shadow, and but I was also like, well, I have had all these opportunities. I've had success in some areas and not in others. Or like, why has my life been so hard for the past eight years when seemingly I'm so lucky and have all of these things that other people don't have? And, you know, again, that was the shadow that I was raised with a lot of shadow about like whatever I had, I sort of felt bad for. It's so interesting because now that I see the world this way, like it is like kind of you have like a matrix moment where you can like, see the code. Because we all also, I mean, you know, I try to keep it focused on myself, but we all have friends that are like the brilliant, beautiful friend that's like, why am I not in a relationship? Well, because your dad was a narcissist and abandoned your family and you encoded that when you were three years old and it's there in your subconscious, you know? But if you're not operating on that assumption of the subconscious, you're just like, I must not be good enough. And it's not even in your conscious mind. And, you know, we all have just people in our lives that are like, when you're looking for a pattern and you don't know it yet, it seems very chaotic. And then once you bring in the subconscious and the idea of neuroplasticity, it all starts to make sense. And for me, it was like a great relief because there were a lot of things in my life that I was like, oh, this isn't my fault. It's just like in my subconscious and I can just show up and do this work and shift it. And that was so liberating. So yeah, I think there's a simplicity to like the way I see the process that you can see in the cocktail glass example, because it's like, Mm -hmm. just writing it down, just writing it down, and then just like doing my homework of the manifestation challenge. And that's it. have not heard of Arma Colostrum, let me tell you why it has quickly become my absolute favorite superfood that I've been taking on a daily basis. Arma is an unrivaled nutrient powerhouse. It has 400 plus pure bioactives that are natural molecules that promote healthy function throughout the body. They include a host of protective antibodies, prebiotic compounds, strengthening peptides, amino acids, trace minerals, immunoglobins, tissue growth factors, antioxidants, and other natural immune factors that work synergistically to enhance your health. This superfood is actually the first piece of nutrients that we receive that all mammals receive from their mothers within 48 to 72 hours after 
giving birth. It is that nutrient dense supplement to really help our bodies thrive, function, and grow to the best of our abilities. There are 5,000 plus studies on this stuff that really show at any age, taking and ingesting colostrum can help our bodies function on the highest level. Now, I started taking this over the summer and pretty much noticed results immediately. Bloating went down, digestion got better, and my immunity seemed to be a lot stronger. I would come across people with colds or sicknesses thinking I'd be coming down with it in a few days, and it seemed to have really supported my innate immune system. It is completely sustainably sourced from a family-owned dairy farm. They only use the surplus of colostrum, and they're able to remove any unnecessary compounds from the colostrum, like casein and fat, which is part of the reason that some dairy can be inflammatory to some people. I'm someone that's very sensitive to dairy, and anytime I have real dairy, I always wind up taking a lactate, but using colostrum, I've never had any issue with it at all. And in fact, it seems to protect me just as well as the dairy pill against some of the dairy that I eat. And part of that reason that that is happening and why I feel like it's been so effective is because it's helping to rebuild your barriers. We talk about having a really strong barrier protection in the lining of our mouth, our sinuses, our lungs, our gut. Our barriers house 80% of our immune system. It's the first line of defense against everything that we inhale and ingest from the outside world. So when you take Armra close to eating you know, inflammatory foods or being in an atmosphere where the air quality isn't as optimal, your barriers are tightening to help protect you from everything else going on. And I will say this cold and flu season this past winter, I was exposed to a crazy cold that everyone around me who was around this person got sick with. I fell sick for maybe one day and then my immune system was able to fight it off while I had been taking the Armra. Then I ran out of Armra for a few weeks. I was like, oh, I'll get it. I'll re-up soon. I'll re-up soon. And I was exposed to the flu and I came down with the flu full force. Now, I'm not saying that it would have 100% prevented me from it because My partner was the one who had the flu, so I had a lot of options of getting sick, but it was interesting to me that I was able to fight off the cold so easily while I was on it, and then when I was off of it for those weeks, that is the period that I wind up coming down with the flu. So this is one of my absolute favorite superfood products out there on the market. I think it is fantastic. I really see results from it. Feel free to ask me questions if you're curious about it. And we have a discount code for you guys. You can use the code TBM for 15% your first order. Again, that is code TBM for 15% off. And if you're interested, you can get the subscription. That way you won't ever run out and you can always have that immune support. Talk about how you sort of experimented with the DIs for your love of the neuroscience of it all and saying like, okay, this is, let's say a limiting belief I'm really stuck on or looping on, or this is a story or narrative from childhood I picked up, coping mechanism. How did you approach tackling that? So in the beginning, I would say there was a lot of Virgo rising, (laughs) dog paddling energy. I was like 36 when I jumped off the cliff and moved. I had been through a lot and I had already done, I was like oriented towards therapy and self-help at that point. I was like starting to move towards accountability, you know, that type of person. Yeah, there was a lot of like impatience, I would say. I have encountered a lot of community members that are really impatient and I'm like, oh, I feel you. I was like that too. How can you not be in this society that's so judgmental about where you are between 30 and 40, which is like so young still with money and scarcity and career and love and all these things, like how can you not be impatient, right? But I was very impatient. So I would say in the beginning with the work, I had a great experience the first time I did inner child that was really intense. And I think that's because I had been really avoiding that type of work. Though I had been in therapy, you know, I hadn't done any somatic stuff. I'd heard this buzzword inner child so much but I was very blocked about actually connecting with that person inside me or with my childhood memories. And again, I think that's so common because it's really scary. You don't want to feel those things. You know, if we love our parents, we don't want to feel any anger towards them. We don't want to go back into the most painful memories of when we were our most vulnerable and our ego has so much protection against it. 
But the first time I did inner child, I remember being like, whoa, what happened? So I had some of that, but there was a lot of dog paddling where I was like, if I can just figure out what my core wound is, then I'll be able to get these things that I need right now or that I'm impatient about. And then, you know, then I'll just like feel great in my relationship and I'll manifest all the things. And so I think I was in that place for a while and that's okay because the work still gets in when you're in that state. But if I could go back in time, I would say like this impatience is just going to make it take longer. But I was in that impatient state in the beginning. And I also did a lot of, I was kind of like the perfect student trap. It's easy to get into when you really want something. I was like on the Pathway community a lot and that was nice. I started hosting magnetic meetups and would like follow it to a T, like would be like, okay, everyone. And now we do our this and then we do our DI. But I did manifest a really great group of TBM friends that fit me perfectly for that time. And I was manifesting, you know, but because of the dog paddling energy, it still was a little bit inconsistent. What were the big things you were calling in at that time? At that time, I think some of my manifestations were a little bit ego-based. I didn't have good stepping stones in between. So I was like manifesting maybe like a dream apartment, but was like not close to believing that I could find that or afford it. I was manifesting like I did want to get married and I didn't know exactly how yet, but I was manifesting that. And I think I even had it on the list, marriage. And yeah, I was manifesting like because of my move from New York to LA being a filmmaker and a writer director and coming from like a very indie world where I was like hiding from the idea of mainstream Hollywood or industry. But then I had had some experiences in the industry that were really good. So I was manifesting like manager and agent for my work, which I'm still manifesting, but I'm in such a different place with it now. Mar- you know, marriage, manager, agent, but also I would say like, I would put things on my list that was like, you know, a writing job, that would pay X amount, but I had never gotten close to that even remotely. So there were a lot of manifestations that were very impatient. I just need this now to feel worthy. So yeah, like in the beginning of hosting my netting meetups, I was doing the work perfectly and I was getting somewhere in terms of doing inner child and shadow, but I hadn't yet had my breakthrough at that point which is the 60 days thing. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, talk about this. Which is like my favorite thing to talk about. I also, I have to say, was very fascinated with the process and was going back and listening to every podcast in one of the old episodes. At some point, Lacey says that it takes 60 days to reinforce a neural pathway. And even though I had heard you and Dr. Tara and Lacey talk over and over again about reinforcement and how key it is, I had not yet realized how important it was because I was very distracted by the find your core wound, conscious detective work stuff and getting stuck in that. And so what I was doing was I was bypassing the grief and just getting really focused on the detective work. The hard part is feeling the grief, but the fun part is being like, I'm in my 30s and I'm responsible for my life and everything's happening for me and the triggers and the pain are only a map if you take it into the subconscious. If you keep it in the conscious state, the map almost doesn't do anything for you. It can almost become, I think, like a a victim mindset that you can then just stay distracted with. I see that a lot. I see people, I mean, I'm guilty of this too. I'm so interested in like getting to the root, finding the block and like understanding like this led to this led to this. And this is why I do this. I get such a high off that. Like it's so fun to find those things and make those connections. There's momentum. It feels actionable. But the issue is when you just theorize and then you don't do anything about it. You've cracked the code, yes, but that's just step one. Step two is going in and processing that pain and processing somatically in the body, like where is that stuck? And then taking that into real life and being like, how is this impacting my behaviors? 
What behaviors do I need to change and actually changing them? And I even think that before the taking it into real life step for me personally is the reinforcement. Because the other thing that can happen is like, you know, you can do all this journaling and find a core wound and it can be, it's interesting that you said hi, because I think it can be kind of addictive. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you're still in a conscious state. I mean, arguably journaling does bring you into the subconscious. So hopefully you are like finding gems that you wouldn't have thought of if you're just walking around living your life, focusing on your job and what you're going to eat for breakfast or whatever. The thing is like the reinforcement is so important. And somehow I had skipped over that because I was doing even like some of your suggestions on core wound and it was really helpful for figuring out the core wound. But then what I would do is I would take it into a DI and be really focused on the attachment to outcome of that particular DI. So it would be like, okay, I have the core wound and I'm going to do a DI and I got to unblock this. And I was really focused on the outcome of just one DI. So when I heard somehow it clicked in my brain, when I heard Lacey saying like, it takes 60 days to overwrite a belief or to shift a neural pathway, I realized like, wait, it takes 60 days. So why don't I just pick a DI and just do it every day for 60 days and see what happens? And in a way, thinking about it now, energetically, it's like the same thing as the cocktail glasses. Why don't you just write this down and then do the work and see what happens without so much attachment to outcome, it can be hard too, because unblocking, I don't think is easy work. When you really unblock, it's emotional. Again, like people who are brave enough to do this type of work, like you're going into your most painful feelings sometimes, anecdotes, and even if you don't have a specific core memory, you're usually like tapping into some sort of feeling. So to have that be so hard, and then on top of it, to be like, okay, each time I do the unblock DI, I need to see an outcome. I think for me, like that was really undermining too. And so the way I got around that was when, okay, I was like, okay, wait, why didn't I notice this before? Lacey literally says it takes 60 days. Maybe in the past, I was so impatient that 60 days seemed like a long time. But now it seems really short for like rewriting something that is interfering with your life on a subconscious level that you haven't thought about that has been looping for 20 years and it's like two months and you could shift it a little bit. So the first time I tried it, I decided to do 60 days of the anxiety DI. And I decided to do it in a really simple way, which was just in the morning, I would get up earlier and just take a walk with it. And the way I made sure that I was going to do it for 60 days was I would just literally write down the date and then make sure I filled out that I did the DI that day. But yeah, I did the anxiety DI for just every morning for 60 days and with like very little attachment. And I think through doing it in that simple way, it allowed me to drop in more and access some stuff and rewrite a lot of my anxiety. It's really interesting to me that just doing the anxiety DI for 60 days shifted me so much because about 40 days in, I just started to feel different. And I was like, oh, that's what rewiring feels like. It's like a little bit of relief. The dog paddling feeling was still there, but it was lessened a lot. And that was around the time that I had put baby on my list, which was a really big deal for me because for a long time, I was sort of in denial that I would want that and didn't want to think about it or deal with it. And the reason why I picked the anxiety DI which is like another piece that I sort of want to expand people on. But I had been on a really low dose of Lexapro for like six or seven months. I will say that during the time that I was on that, it did really help my unblocking process also. And I think like in spiritual communities, sometimes any sort of pharmaceutical is stigmatized, but I was very expanded by different spiritual people talking about how, yeah, you can use that as a tool once in a while. So during those six months, I was already having a better time with the work. It was more effective and I was making progress. And then as I titrated off of the Lexapro, I was doing the anxiety DI every day. Again, and this is something you do with your doctor and antidepressants obviously affect your brain chemistry and 
when you're going off of it, you have to do it with a doctor. But, you know, and I was on a very low dose, but as I was going off of it, doing the anxiety DI every day, I was not experiencing anxiety and I was reprogramming a lot of my anxiety. And also previous to that, I had been building my manifestation process because during that time when I was on Lexapro doing the work consistently, not as consistently as the 60 days, but trying to have a daily practice. That's when I got married. I was setting boundaries with my family like never before. A really fun manifestation was I actually manifested the dress I got married in that was like a pretty, you know, pricey designer dress. And I manifested it for $200 on the real real because financially we were just you know, still living a bit in scarcity. And I was still using the process to manifest things like that. But yeah, I manifested like the exact dress I wanted that fit me perfectly for $200. I want to highlight something here too for people. So like when we guide you through the manifestation challenge or how to manifest. That's like the first thing everyone starts with, right? Like if you start during the winter season, you're doing the manifestation challenge. Or if you start another part of the year, we always say start with how to manifest. That's taking you through like the principles, the pillars of this process. And one of the sections of there is unblocking. And for the challenge, we'll have like a week and we'll have some of our like heaviest hitting DIs to get that core wound. And then we say, you know, you can go into inner child or shadow to get that deeper unblocking or utilize the daily practice. That is our deep imagining library where everything lives. That's where you can do the unblocking. But what we're saying for that next step is like figure out how you want to tackle your limiting beliefs, your subconscious mind through the DI work. And there's a lot of different avenues, right? Like I just listed a whole bunch of stuff. But one of the things I think I don't know if people really grasp is that the unblocking takes so much consistent effort. Dr. Tara talks about this a lot. And the 60 days was something that Lacey saw was most effective for her, for her clients. So the 60 days to a new neural pathway was based on a few different things. So one, everyone, brain chemistry is different and there's going to be a different amount of timelines. But this was the average amount of days that people have seen the most results. There was a study done on how long it takes to make a habit automatic, which means that it is overriding the neural pathway of how the brain operates. And that study, I think it was about 66 days on average, most people were able to transform those habits to automatic. Lacey also saw with her clients, with members, with herself, that 60 days was enough to see really profound impacts on your manifestation based off of the unblocking work for 60 days. But also it's the time that it's entrenching. Now, again, part of this is anecdotal. Part of this is based on a habit study. We don't have real hard and fast evidence on this because every single brain is so different and hasn't been studied in that way yet. But it does give you that trust muscle of hope and understanding that, okay, well, if I can commit to this 60 days or even these 30 days, I'm going to make some serious progress in my limiting beliefs, getting overwritten and putting down new neural pathways of high self-worth, right? Whatever that shift or belief we want to move is, if we can commit to that, it can make a massive, massive difference. And I think what your goal is like, how can you, and people DM me this all the time. They're like, this is my block, blah, blah, blah. What, what DI should I do? And I'll give them a list of DIs. And I'm like, just circle between these DIs. Just spend a month and hit these DIs. Like whenever your tests and triggers come up, what is your fear around this limiting belief? What's your anxiety around it? Do the inner child one when your inner child's sad. Consistently hit that same neural pathway from all the different angles. Or if it works for you, pick one and hit it from that angle again and again and again and again. Because yes, like you said, there is the unblocking moment where you're like, holy cow, like I had such an emotional release. And now it's like, let's reinforce it. Do it again and again and again so it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And it takes also getting stronger by expansion. 
seeing to believe you can do things, waking up and having a little bit less anxiety. You're like, wow, I could have less anxiety today. That feels so different. Okay. Taking the aligned action to move away, let's say from the Lexapro. Cause if that was a ping, you're like, okay, I'm going to take this action and that's going to be scary, but okay. How can I like start moving in that direction? It was because I wrote down baby on my list, you know, so it was like the beginning of the actions. Yeah. So it's like you have to hit it from all of those angles again and again and again, and that is where you're going to see that shift. There are so many people out there settling for unfulfilling relationships or people who are stuck in toxic jobs, living in places and spaces that don't inspire them, and especially people who feel like they'll never be able to afford the things and the life that they truly desire. How do I know that? Because it was me before I discovered that manifestation is actually a totally viable, scientifically proven method of creating the life you want. I'm Lacey. I'm the founder of To Be Magnetic. And if you're not familiar with us, we at TBM offer workshops that teach you how to manifest literally everything from love to money to career to beyond. Our courses are the most effective manifestation method on the market. And that's because of a secret that I discovered years ago about manifestation, which is you do not manifest from your thoughts. You manifest from your subconscious beliefs. So after decades of client research and input from leading doctors and therapists, we design courses that help you rewire your subconscious mind to align with what you want to manifest. And the best part of all for any skeptic out there, our work is completely scientifically proven to work. Just ask the tens of thousands of members inside our Pathway membership, which gives you unlimited access to all of our workshops, tools, and offerings that you'll use over the course of a year. This includes workshops on inner child, shadow, boundaries, love, money, the infamous ruts, and the horrible rock bottoms, and so much more. Use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to receive $20 off your first TBM purchase. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. I also think the anxiety one is such a cool one to do as well because it's technically an unblocking one, but it's not like let's get to the core wound unblocking. Right. But anxiety can be one of those, and I think of it almost like IFS parts, you know, internal family systems. It's like anxiety is a manifestation of sorts of one of your parts coping mechanisms. So it's like, how can we deal with that sensation every single day so it feels safe? And then that pathway becomes stronger and then becomes the default pathway. Exactly. And I would even take it a step further in terms of doing the DIs, which I think is sort of like almost my ethos around the work of like, you know what, don't even worry about which DI it is. It honestly doesn't matter as much as just doing one. I used anxiety DI to get pregnant and I also threw everything at that manifestation. I was expanding. I was on the pathway community looking at people who got pregnant naturally after a certain point. I was reading all the books about it. I read the Spirit Babies book. I did the bean protocol in a loose way. Again, not a perfectionistic way, but it still really helped my cycle. I read Elisa Vitti's book and I did some of her supplements for fertility. And there's the action. Right, exactly. I was doing all three prongs. I was, Mm -hmm. I, I had already unblocked a lot and I was expanding and I was taking action and I was like, and I'm gonna do the anxiety DI for 60 days and doing all that stuff for 60 days, like 60 days later, I was on my honeymoon And I also even did some spiritual woo-woo stuff, but not from a superstitious place of like, this is going to tell me. Because with TBM, it's like, no, we believe in free will. We believe in neuroscience also. And so it's a neural pathway thing, right? And I was, of course, doing all the physical things like the bean protocol and all these things are like 
you know, have outcomes for fertility. Right. So I was doing all of that stuff, but it was like after 60 days of hardcore expanding and action and anxiety DI, I was on my honeymoon and we arrive at the hotel and we got upgraded to this corner room. And again, we were still in a place of much more scarcity than now. Since then, I unblocked a lot around money and we are in actually a really different place. But we arrived at the hotel and they upgraded us to a corner room. And by that time, I was in such a surrendered state, bringing it back to what we spoke about in the very beginning of surrender. But it was crazy because like we got to Hawaii and we got upgraded to a room. And by that time, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, it's a manifestation. We looked out at the beach from the hotel room and they were like, the beach is closed. And I was like, why is the beach closed? And it was because there was a seal who had given birth to a pup right outside our hotel room. Wow. And so I looked out our onto our balcony and there was this mother seal with her newborn pup. Oh. And I was like, wow, like, because, you know, I had spent 60 days just expanding, doing a DI and taking actions. But anyway, so I'm like looking at this mother seal and her pup and I'm like, okay, I get, I, this is special. I see you universe. You know? Yeah, you. I see you universe. <laughs> but I still wasn't in a dog paddling mode of like, that means it has to be my manifestation, right? I was just like taking it in because when you have that kind of 60 day process, you don't need to glom on to any one thing, right? Because there's a flow that starts to take you where you feel more, or for me, I'll speak for myself. I felt like it's the process that is my guide. And it's, it's like the process that allows me to feel grounded and it's not any one external thing, you know? And so that means that I could just appreciate this insane thing of this mother seal who I then watched all week. But anyway, basically like my daughter, my baby that I'm about to have in like seven days was conceived that first day that we arrived there or like in the sometime that week, you know, and it was after 60 days of just anxiety DI and a ton of expansion and action and the surrender that came from doing the DI because the DI just calmed me down. It just made me feel good. And the other thing was that because I wasn't dog paddling each time I did the DI, I would just look forward to it as a ritual and way more pings and positive thoughts and things came through because I wasn't going into the DI trying to make something happen. It was just when it's a habit, I think that the rewiring can just kind of happen. And so that's how I was able to just get more pings and thoughts and feelings and just relax. And of course, also that's really good for conception because conception is such a mysterious process. And any doctor will tell you that it's quite mysterious, even when Sometimes they find something really wrong with someone fertility wise and they still get pregnant and sometimes there's nothing wrong and they can't, you know, it's very mysterious. So that was crazy because it was like the 60 days of all of that stuff and then getting to Hawaii and just being so happy to be there with my partner, my husband that, you know, we were on our honeymoon, seeing that seal mom. (laughs) (laughs) And then, you know, I found out I was pregnant a few weeks later and I honestly almost didn't believe it because that was we we weren't like trying per se, but it was like the first time we didn't use protection and kind of had sex at the right time, which hopefully my partner doesn't mind me saying in public. But <laughs> but I'm just being real because it's like I do want to expand people because people have a lot of limiting beliefs about what's possible. And obviously caveat, like with this medical stuff and with conception, it's extremely mysterious. And it's also a trigger for a lot of women that have had fertility difficulties. And so you know, I want to be sensitive to that, but I also just want to expand people because there's a lot of fear around conceiving later in life and, and a lot of self-judgment. You're my expander. I mean, I need, I need people who are having babies later in life because the closer I, the older I get, I mean, my birthday is going to be like next week. And I was like, oh my gosh, I really need to start thinking about all that, you know, that you just, you feel that fear, that pressure is not not there. It's stressful. And all the messages we're getting are like, 
stressful, but actually there's so much expansion out there. There's a great thread on the Pathway community of just people whose moms had them when they were 40 ish. Oh, I love that. And I'm like, these people seem so, they have like the best relationships with their parents. And there's a book I read called Late Motherhood and the Joys of Late Motherhood or something like that. And there's a lot of literature out there too, that's expansive. And, you know, societally, there's so much judgment, but when you have a baby later, I mean, like my husband and I are so much more mature than we were 10 years ago, you know? So you know, there are advantages to doing things on your own timeline. And I think with a lot of this work too, it is about just like relaxing into your own timeline. Again, you cannot just do that unless like that has to be earned. You have to unblock the limiting beliefs to get to that point. There's no way you can just go from having all of these subconscious beliefs to then suddenly accepting yourself. That's why the manifestation piece is good, because it's not actually about materialism, although I'm totally with that. I love the cocktail glasses and the wedding dress. I don't have shadow about that stuff anymore, which is great. I mean, I have some shadow. You know, I'm in process also. It lightens. It's like you shed shed old layers. It's also interesting, I think, when people first come to TBM, a lot of it is that external material, like life has to change now. And then they like really dive in and they start having those big internal shifts and they just subtly wake up different and, you know, more embodied and more loving and compassionate and understanding. And I think that's where it's like the magic is happening and the material is helping us to dance there. It's like our our conductor of sorts guiding us to do that inner work because like you said it is it's work. It's hard to go in and have those those big healing moments. It's hard to process the past. There's a reason why so many generations before us push it down was the way to get through because it was could swallow you whole. Now it's like this invitation to understand that it's not going to swallow us whole and we can we can feel into it with a little bit more ease. Yeah, and it's it's a privilege too like in a good way to be at this moment in time where in the scientific community all of the things that have been uncovered about the subconscious and about intergenerational trauma that help people get out of the shadow, you know, whereas like my parents generation, they would just blame themselves because they were like, well, I was born in the 50s after the war. So why am I so messed up? And it's like carrying around that shadow of being spoiled and privileged and then maybe that getting passed on to me or something. And again, though, I would say like, yes, it is because the unblocking is so hard. I would say if you're having a hard time with it, why don't you just trick yourself by picking the DI that seems easiest and not scary and just doing it for 60 days? Because I got pregnant after 60 days of anxiety DI and then I manifested our dream apartment with literally everything on my list and my husband's list. As hard it is, as it is to like get up and go to the gym and work out, people do that. And I'm like doing a 20 minute DI is easier than that, I think. A thousand percent, at least for me. Yeah. <laughs> if you're scared, like do, you know, as soon as you manifest one thing, I think you could do the trust muscle DI every day. And that one's only 10 minutes. And maybe for the first week, you're not dropping in and you feel stupid, just like I did many times. But maybe on day seven, something happens. And then maybe on day 11, something else happens. And then maybe on day 30, you get a ping saying, go here. Or, you know, on day 31, you run into an expander because... I also really do think that the unblocking is key for expansion. And I've heard people say they're having trouble expanding and I relate to that too. So if you think about it, expansion, like what is expansion? It's they have it so I can have it too. And it's like, yes, scientifically expansion has also proven and with all the records of people that run a mile this fast and then the next year someone can break the record. But it's like, if expansion is they have it so I can have it too, but you're so blocked about being less than that other person or they grew up this way and I didn't have that or they, or they have this that I don't have, then it's going to block the expansion as well. So 
You could be like writing down expanders, looking at them on social media, asking them out for coffee, sitting across from them at coffee. It'll do something. But if you're doing a DI every day, that's like subtly rewiring you while you're doing that, you might just suddenly find yourself showing up in a way where you're able to really absorb it. I love that you point that out too about the expansion because I feel like one begets the other. To be expanded by someone, you have to be in a state of openness and reception. And you have to have a certain level of self-worth. You have to believe that because they had it, it's possible for you too. And if you don't feel that that is okay, that's actually probably really normal. You're program, like society programs us to pit one another against each other. If they have it, it means I can't have it. It just means that there's some neuroplasticity that needs to be at work in the subconscious. That's all that that means. You just need to sit with that again and again and again so you can write that new story. That's the thing that's so cool is you have the power to write your own story. Yeah. And you don't have to be so in control of it. You can just experiment, try doing something every day for two months. There are forces at work that you're not in control of that will help. And I think like deep down the parts of us, like our subconscious probably wants to heal and integrate. Oh my gosh, Sonia, thank you so much. This has <laughs> been so powerful and so magical. I cannot believe we're recording so close to your due date. I told her before we started, I was like, we are in a portal. I know. I, I'm not going to lie. I feel really pregnant right now. I feel like hot. <laughs> you look fantastic. And the wisdom coming through is just incredible. Thank you so much. And thank you for for being a guiding light in this community, for hosting the Magnetic Meetups, for connecting with people in the community group, for sharing on the process episode. And thank you. Thank you. You are such a guiding light for me. I love this podcast and it's meant so much to me and educated me so much. And I'm just so grateful that we got to sit down and I got to nerd out a little bit about it and I just love everything you do with To Be Magnetic. And I don't know, I love the way you approach and structure the work. Like for me personally, it's just made a huge difference. And I just knew it was going to be so fun to talk to you. And I'm just very grateful to you. And I'm very grateful to TBM. This has been the best year of my life. And it's really because of this work and just finding a way to show up for myself getting away from perfectionism with it and just being able to unlock some of these things. It's so cheesy, but it's really life-changing. So, Well, I'm getting teary-eyed, so it's not cheesy. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Sonia. All right, we'll see you next time, guys. Bye. Hope you all enjoyed that episode as much as we did. And if you're starting to get a feel for this to be magnetic manifestation process, but aren't completely sold yet, let me point you to some of our free offerings. You can check out the expanded podcast episode called how to manifest anything you desire where Lacey, the founder and I break down exactly what this process is all about. You can check out the motivation, which is our testimonial library with thousands of testimonials of people who have manifested wild things using this process. Or you could check out our free quiz to find out what manifestation phase you were in, the rut, the rock bottom, the next level, or the magic dark, and how you can navigate. Enjoy. We'll see you next week.